Hey all, I wanted to share a presentation that I've put together helping another chiropractor who's working on providing musculoskeletal care during this coronavirus pandemic. And so I dug into the research, put it all together, or at least what I found into a slide deck, and I wanted to share it because I know this is a conversation that's ongoing across the country, especially in the next gen ACA of chiropractors wanting to offer services to do what they can to flatten the curve. So I don't have the answers. I don't know exactly how to go about this, but I wanted to put this together and provide it as a resource so that people can use it and improve upon it and share and continue the conversation. So what are we talking about with flattening the curve? Well, it's this idea that during a pandemic that spreads rapidly as does COVID-19, this is what it would look like if there were no protective measures, right? So if you're not social distancing, if you're not using protective, personal protective equipment in hospital and in clinic settings, um, if people are just going about their day-to-day -day lives, the number of cases will exponentially increase and hit a peak very quickly. But if we take measures, protective measures, to slow that down, we, we're not going to necessarily change the area under the curve, right? The same amount of people may get ill, may contract this virus and the disease, COVID. Um, but if implementing these protective measures can slow it down, that flattens the curve, which is important because we only have so much healthcare capacity. And so if we can um, slow it down to the point where our hospitals, urgent cares can manage the inflow, have enough hospital beds, then that is a good thing, even if the same number of people get the disease. So there are a couple factors to consider, at least in this conversation we're having about the role of chiropractors. The number one is the burden on the healthcare system. Okay, so patients coming into the ED uh, put a burden on it, put a pressure on it and the more we can reduce that the better and then there's just the exposure of people going into a hospital or urgent care where other people are sick and so even if they don't have the virus they may be at a greater risk to contract it in a recent paper in JAMA just over a week ago um, this article is about supporting the healthcare workforce it was clearly stated that one problem is the emergency department where crowding is a identified as a major concern. Too many people going in then can be handled. This is where we come in potentially because musculoskeletal disorders are the most common class of complaints among patients presenting for care in the emergency departments. In fact, internationally in this paper um, by Matifat et al., the numbers are that musculoskeletal disorders represent more than 25% of all emergency department visits. Now, papers here in the States aren't quite that dramatic. Um, the data from the CDC in their National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, and this, these numbers are from 2017, the most recent, there were 139 million visits to the emergency department that year. Of those, 11.21 million fell into that category of musculoskeletal system, the M00 to M99 um, ICD-10 codes. Of those 11.21 million, about 40% are low severity musculoskeletal complaints, which to me means that there are roughly four and a half million emergency department visits that don't need to be emergency department visits. Right? These are low severity, um, probably non-acute musculoskeletal conditions, chronic low back pain that just flares up, this type of thing that can feasibly be managed by chiropractors. In another paper, um, this is by Irwin, discussing the role of primary spine care. So because of this overwhelming burden of musculoskeletal conditions on the healthcare system, this idea of a primary spine care provider could be helpful. So the PSP is um, a concept first conceived by Scott Haldeman and then later 
um, promoted by Don Murphy and others. In fact, um, Don Murphy's books, the CRISP books, pretty much revolve around this model. So the idea is that a primary spine care practitioner plays the role of a PCP or a GP for musculoskeletal complaints, right? So your GP can see 80% of conditions and manage it without referral. A PSP would do the same specifically for musculoskeletal complaints. Chiropractors happen to be ideally suited to fill this role, okay? Um, the PSP or the primary spine practitioner could be a physical therapist, could be a physiatrist, but chiropractors have great training to allow them to fill this role. And this was done in Wisconsin. Uh, there's a paper discussing this role. Um, in Massachusetts, Plymouth, Massachusetts at Jordan Hospital, uh, this paper by Peskowski outlines the spine care pathway that was implemented. And it looks like this. It's quite simple. It, it, it makes sense uh, if you think about it. So a patient would present to urgent care, the emergency department, or primary care. And uh, the idea is if it is a musculoskeletal primary complaint, that they would be triaged or evaluated by a chiropractor, a PT, or an MD. And if there were any red flags, we know to look for this, things like history of trauma, history of cancer, fracture, that type of thing. If they exist, that patient's going to go to the ED, right? Go the regular medical route. If there are no red flags, then kind of a second evaluation will take place to determine whether they could um, potentially go through conservative care. If yes, then they are classified in this case, they mainly used um, kind of the McKenzie method, uh, looking for a, a directional preference and that type of thing with end range loading. And then they go on to management by this musculoskeletal practitioner, whatever it may be. So it's an interesting model, and um, similar things have been done in many other situations. In England and Europe, it's very common for a physical therapist to be in the emergency department to fill this role. And so there's data out there that shows some of the benefits. Um, primarily, it can deburden the hospitals, right? You're pulling away uh, these musculoskeletal patients from the ED, from the emergency physicians who are working with other more serious care uh, cases, potentially pulling them out of urgent care as well. So deburdening the hospitals. You're also decreasing exposure of patients to other ill patients. So in situations like the coronavirus pandemic, you're lowering that vector. Um, there are many other benefits that aren't specific to the current situation, but are ne nevertheless positive, right? Chiropractors um, and other physical medicine practitioners tend to do less imaging. It results in less spinal injections, less surgeries. That means, in general, that care by a chiropractor is much less expensive, 20 to 40 percent, some numbers show, than if patients are seen by an MD, partly because of the decreased cost of um, interventions. And inter initiating care with a chiropractor can actually decrease opioid exposure. This has been another um, hot topic in, in our field. So we know that these are some other benefits other than decreasing the burden and exposure of patients to uh, viruses. There are some concerns though, right? Questions that may came up, come up. So I wanted to address those. Um, number one, what are patients going to think? Well, the data out there uh, from that same paper of the Jordan Hospital is that 95% of patients rated their care as excellent when they were seen by the chiropractor instead of the medical doctor. Another concern as well, would these advanced practice providers or primary spine providers be as effective? And the truth is, yeah, they are as effective or even more effective than usual medical care for pain as well as disability, mainly in the short term, but they're as effective in the long term as well. Um, another concern may be, well, what about the risk of missing a serious condition, right? Our chiropractors are going to catch these things. Um, in general, yeah, we're, we're trained to find these red flags. And uh, the reality is that 
the prevalence of serious spinal pathologies in primary care is less than 1%, but in the emergency department, it is up to about 7.5%, probably a little bit lower than in most cases, 2 to 5%. Um, but there's a portion, right? But as long as you're following those red flags, these can be caught. Those red flags are effective at um, detecting potential serious pathologies. Okay, so with that data in mind, what are the next steps? Can chiropractors fill a role during this coronavirus pandemic to um, deburden the, the healthcare system and to prevent the spread of coronavirus? Well, it's really unclear at this point. This is where I don't have the answers. Um, other people have had more experience in this area and are figuring this out. So some things to consider. Well, first of all, the models that I showed, the data that we have, is with a chiropractor or physical therapist integrated into the hospital system. So they are right there where the patient is going to come anyway. Um, the ambulance may deliver them. Uh, but what we're talking about in most cases right now is something that's not going to take a while to develop. We want to implement this as soon as possible. We want to have a rapid response. We're probably talking about sending patients to chiropractic clinics rather than going to the ED. And that may not be practical. I know here in South Dakota, um, the state law, and I'm being trained as an EMT, but not having much experience riding on a rig or anything, um, most states have laws where ambulance have to transport to the emergency department. And so to divert them to reroute to a community clinic may not be feasible. So these are the, some things that we've got to um, grapple with. Other things to consider are, well, the benefits of treating patients like this, or you do decrease that burden on the healthcare system, you do decrease exposure, but you have to weigh that against the risks of, um, number one, being a vector yourself, and your clinic as well to transmit coronavirus, right? You're not completely isolating um, and shutting down and, and stopping the spread. The other thing is that some anecdotal evidence is that during pandemics like this, the musculoskeletal burden actually goes down. People are aware um, that there's more serious things going on. They're aware that they put themselves at risk for contracting um, this disease. And so even though they're in pain, they stay home. And so the effect that we have may not be all that great. What is clear, however, is that we can play a role. And mainly that is informing patients of the correct ways to go about preventing um, passing on or contracting the coronavirus. So following the CDC recommendations, following the information provided by the World Health Organization, as well as the World Federation of Chiropractic message on proper advertising, on uh, being consistent with messaging with your patients. Um, so being an informed healthcare provider is probably our first role and being a good source of information. So that's what I have. Again, I don't have the answers. I'm not totally sure of the proper way to approach this, but I think it's a good conversation to have. Um, we need to grapple with those decisions between staying open to provide care versus shutting down to prevent being part of the spread ourselves. So I'm curious to hear what you think. Please leave your comments below and check out my website where I'll post um, in a blog this video as well as the PowerPoint to share. So um, you can download it, you can make changes, you can um, use it as you see fit. And I hope that it's helpful. Hopefully we can improve upon it and you can share things with me as well. Thanks for watching. I hope that's informative.